Good. Well, uh, good to see you here uh, this evening. And um, we're thinking about Samuel Rutherford, and I'm calling this lecture Marching to Emmanuel's Land, uh, words that uh, we'll be singing later, which come from uh, the hymn about uh, Rutherford, which was drawn from extracts of his writings, his letters, uh, and we'll hear more about that in time. Let me just give a few caveats at the beginning. I am not an expert on Samuel Rutherford, not an expert on anything very much, um, but I did do a bit of study and research uh, into him some 25 years ago plus. One of the reasons was I was asked to write uh, by one of my former theology professors. I was asked to write an article for the Dictionary of 17th Century British Philosophers. And uh, the entry on Samuel Rutherford is by yours truly. Available on Amazon in two volumes for £1,550. <laughs> I may be able to get you a 5% discount when you're running out there, but um, there we are. At one time I was quite well versed in uh, 17th century uh, history and theology, but for the last quarter of a century, the 21st century has been a bit more uh, taking up my attention. So some of these things are, are sketchy but I shall do my best. Um, and Samuel Rutherford was a mighty figure. He was a great man of God. Uh, his legacy was very great in Scotland and uh, far beyond Scotland. Um, that's why, for example, in the early 1980s, William Still and my father, when they were setting up a, a theological study center, it was called Rutherford House uh, for that reason, probably because he stood out as the most, uh, one of the most important uh, theologians in Scottish history. And history is important, uh, and our church history is important. Uh, if we forget history, as the saying goes, you know, we are often consigned to, to repeat history. And of course, history does repeat in many ways, doesn't it? There's nothing new under the sun. And many of the issues facing the church uh, today are issues that have faced it before in, in previous ages. And it is helpful for us. I think it's quite important for us to know a little of that past. So what I want to do is just give you a flavor of uh, his life, his ministry, his uh, theology, uh, his political and uh, social influence and legacy, and perhaps draw, uh, as we go along, one or two lessons uh, for all of us. And I'm going to try and roughly go along this uh, handout here. So let's begin with his early life and times. Sam Rother was born in, uh, near Jedburgh, a place called Nisbet in Roxburghshire, in the year 1600. And uh, no doubt... The pleasant borders countryside were uh, a place of tranquility, but in that year there were already pretty ominous clouds gathering over the land of Scotland, clouds of conflict that were going to uh, engulf the church and the nation uh, until the very last decade of that century, uh, the 17th century. And I doubt his family or he could possibly have known in these early years just how much his life and his work are going to be shaped by these uh, momentous events of state that occurred in the time of his uh, early life. The Reformation was established in Scotland in 1560. The Presbyterian Church was apparently wholeheartedly endorsed by King James VI in the Act of Parliament of 1592. James called it, quotes, the sincerest Kirk in all the world. And he promised to maintain it and protect it so long as I brook my life and crown. And it, that 19, uh, uh, 1592 act, which was called the Charter of Presbytery, that confirmed all the privileges. It gave liberty of self-government. It gave immunity from all uh, state interference in the Kirk. It officially abolished all Episcopal uh, jurisdictions. And uh, notably, in our judicial review just a few years ago in 2021, that was referenced and upheld as one of the reasons why that judicial review succeeded. So that was 1592. But within a few years, by 1596, these harmonious relations apparently between the church and the king had badly soured. And the tide had turned against the cause of a self-governing Presbyterian church in Scotland. James realized that his conception of the divine right of kings couldn't coexist with a church full of these uncontrollable ministers. Because like Elijah, they were called to correct him, criticize him publicly when his policies fell short of their expectations. And of course, as we know, kings don't like that. Prime ministers and politicians don't like that. 
And it became increasingly clear to James that the only way that he could have the kind of sovereignty that he was determined to have in his land and over the church was to reintroduce bishops. And he would be able to exert uh, pressure and control on them and uh, bring things into line. And of course, by 1603, the union of the crowns meant he'd been crowned king in England and moved to London. And as one church historian says, he found there a church whose clergy surrounded him with nauseating flattery. And no doubt that helped him to uh, cement his belief that the Episcopal system was far more congenial to the purposes of kings. And so he wanted to extend those benefits as he saw them to his northern kingdom of Scotland. And so began uh, an often violent uh, struggle between uh, James I and then his son Charles I and his grandson Charles II uh, and the church and the nation. They fought for control of both the church and the state in Scotland, and in fact, in the rest of the British Isles. And it really was one of the most turbulent periods in our nation's history. And through these long years, amid the uh, many changes that uh, came, amid the many entanglements of church and state, there were many uh, brave, uh, very principled churchmen who sought to defend the Reformation faith, uh, defend their national church, both against the onslaught of doctrinal error, but also uh, against the repression that came from kings, uh, from parliament, and uh, from their prelates, the bishops that they appointed. So those were the times in which Samuel Rutherford lived. If you want to read more, a good place is in uh, Burley's Church History of Scotland. It's one of the books uh, listed on the back of your sheet. Well, after schooling in, uh, in Jedburgh, uh, Rutherford went to Edinburgh University and gained an MA, and uh, in 1621, he graduated. He was an excellent classicist. They said that uh, all his days he wrote better in Latin than he did uh, in English, uh, so that's quite something. And he taught at the university for some time as a professor of humanities. Um, in 1625, for reasons that are a bit unclear, there was some kind of accusation that took place and some sort of scandal. Nobody really quite knows what happened, but uh, he, he stepped aside from his position. But it couldn't have been anything uh, terribly serious because he went on to study theology. And um, in 1627, he took up the parish of Anworth uh, in, in Galloway. And he was a much-loved pastor. He was a warm-hearted preacher and pastor. And probably he was more content during that period of his life than uh, at any other. Um, Although he had a lot of personal heartbreak. He was uh, young. His young wife bore him uh, two children during that time, but both his wife and his two children died uh, in these early years of his ministry. So it was also a time of sadness. Apparently, he was somewhat lacking in natural eloquence, but uh, he was known, nevertheless, as, quote, one of the most moving and affectionate preachers of his time. He loved uh, his preacher loved his congregation. He lived for them. And uh, his pastoral devotion was legendary. Folk boasted of his ministers, quote, that he is always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always catechizing, always writing, and always studying. So even if he was doing all of those things simultaneously, it's quite impressive, isn't it? And um, seems a bit incredible to us, but maybe pastors today have just got a bit soft and lazy. I don't know. But he didn't have any email. He didn't have a mobile phone and things like that. But I think what it underlines is that being a true preacher of Christ and a pastor was, for him, the highest calling of all. And it was his desire for the spiritual well-being of his ordinary congregation and other ordinary congregations in Scotland um, that fueled everything he did, even when his ministry became much, much wider and much beyond uh, his own parish and the world of theology, the world of uh, church government, political theory, and so on. I guess he was like Jude, he wanted to speak and write just about much more felicitous things about our common salvation. But you see, Rutherford lived in days when you couldn't, like Jude, you couldn't avoid the call to contend for the faith against all kinds of assaults and threats, both from inside the church and uh, from outside. And so he had to be a contending churchman. Despite his uh, devotion, to the people of Anworth, his heart, his mind were nevertheless fully engaged with great issues of the day in terms of church and state. Now, he was a convinced uh, Presbyterian. He was a strong defender of the Reformed faith. 
And so his persistent non-conformity to these uh, Episcopalian patterns of worship, which were being demanded by King James and, uh, and forced on the people by, um, uh, I think, all the Articles of Perth, uh, that just naturally brought him into, into conflict with the establishment powers and uh, with the powers that be. Now, the Articles of Perth were five articles that were brought before the General Assembly, which was uh, convened in 1618, it was James's first visit back to Scotland since his coronation, 15 years later. He preferred it down in London. Um, and part of his purpose in coming was to enforce this Episcopalianism on Scotland. And that was his way of forcing the church to kowtow to the state uh, and to his authority, of course. And what these articles demanded was a reversion to procedures that had been abolished at, during the Reformation. Five things were kneeling for reception of communion, sanction for private communion, private baptism, confirmation of children by the bishop, and special observation of high and holy days in the church. And it was enforced a few years later by uh, the parliament in 1621. Now, you may listen to that and think, well, what was the big deal about that? I mean, honestly, just it's fairly trivial, isn't it? Surely whether you sit for communion or you kneel for communion... And in and of themselves may be, but the thing is, it's what these things represented. And what they represented was highly charged symbolism that was publicly reversing um, the core issues of the Reformation, the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. It was to make reception with God once again dependent on a human priesthood, on various uh, religious observances and rites and so on. So in the context of the day, to be forced to kneel for communion, it really was akin to Dan Daniel, for example, in his day, being forced to bow down to the image of the emperor on the plains in Babylon, equivalent to God's people taking the mark of the beast so that they could continue their lives. It's a bit like circumcision. If you think about the New Testament, Paul says very clearly, doesn't he, in itself, it's nothing. You can have it or not have it, doesn't matter. Paul was quite happy to circumcise uh, Timothy, for example, because in that context, didn't undermine the gospel at all. But when circumcision was demanded of the Gentiles by Judaizing believers, Paul absolutely fought it tooth and nail. He would have died rather than accept that. Why? Well, because it would have totally destroyed the gospel of free grace. In that context, it symbolized absolutely everything. It was the antithesis of the gospel. And that's what these articles did in that day. It's very, very important that we, we get clear about that. We see the core principle of it. Don't get hung up on, on, on just the, the particular expressions because those can change in different times and in different circumstances. But make no mistake, in 1618, that was a core gospel issue. And people were willing to die for that. Rutherford would not take the knee, as it were, to that state ideology. He was a non-conformist. And that meant taking your life in your hands uh, in those days. He was charged with nonconformity in 1630. And that occasionally escaped punishment. But then the last straw was when he published in 1636 a theological work in which he vigorously attacked Arminianism, which then was, the, again, a theological system very much opposing the Reformation doctrine uh, of, the, of the gospel of God, the grace of God at work in Christ. And so that article, that, that book that he wrote, was rightly construed as a direct attack on the Archbishop of Canterbury then, Archbishop Lord, who was, of course, King Charles I's spiritual advisor. And um, he was promulgating that doctrine in Scotland, and it was all part of the effort to dominate the church by the crown and by the prelates who were in hock to the crown. It was to try and restore the kind of blanket Anglo-Catholicism, which was really just... Uh, going back to the pre-Reformation faith. So in 1636, for his crimes, uh, Rutherford was deposed from his parish by the Court of High Commission in Edinburgh. He was barred from preaching anywhere, and they sent him into exile. They sent him to Aberdeen. And uh, not just because it's far away and cold, but because Aberdeen was a stronghold of Episcopacy and Arminianism at, at that time, and he was forced to stay there for 18 months. And I remember when I was reading about this uh, first, when I was studying theology in Aberdeen, I thought, well, nothing much has changed in 400 years. It feels pretty much like a theological exile. But anyway, 
Now, that was 1636. Two years later, things changed. 1638, there was a rebellion of the Scots. You've heard, I'm sure, of the National Covenant, which was signed by many leading Scots in the uh, graveyard in um, uh, uh, Greyfriars Church in Edinburgh. And in a way, the National Covenant was a high point of Scottish church history because it rejected this attempt by King Charles and the Archbishop Lord to force the church to confirm to English liturgical practice and uh, English church governments. And uh, they stood up against the king and the king backed down. Now, after this, Rutherford just wanted to go back and stay in his parish, but his uh, qualities, his abilities were needed by the wider church. And very quickly, he found himself appointed the professor of divinity in St. Andrews. And uh, it was the same General Assembly of 1638 that appointed him, repealed those articles of Perth. So it was a complete turnaround. Now, he left his parish in Amworth very reluctantly, but... Um, and only on the condition that he was allowed to preach regularly in the parish uh, in St. Andrews because he lamented what he called the dumb Sabbaths that he'd been forced uh, to spend in Aberdeen in exile. He didn't want to be exiled any longer from his, his pulpit ministry, which he always thought uh, was the most important thing. 1640, he married his second wife. She bore him seven children, although... Um, only either one or two, we're not quite sure, but at the most, only two of them uh, survived him. So out of nine children, only two survived him. And that's just a reminder of the different days that we lived in. That really wasn't all that uncommon. But nevertheless, still not easy. In 1643, a few years later, again, he was prevailed upon by the wider church. By now, of course, the English Civil War was in full swing. And the Scots then joined with the English parliamentarians under what was called the Solemn League and Covenant. So the Scots sent their army against the king. And in the middle of all that, Rutherford was dispatched to London to sit as part of the Westminster Assembly, which I'm sure you'll have heard of. That was a commission that had now already been set up by the English Parliament, which was now pro-Presbyterian, and it was set up deliberately to, and I'm quoting, to reform properly the doctrine, worship, and government of the Church of England in a manner most agreeable to God's holy word and most apt to procure and preserve the peace of the church at home and nearer agreement with the Church of Scotland and other reformed churches abroad. So despite um, poor health, actually, by this time and uh, grief of uh, family bereavements at home, he had four years uh, in London, in exile, but actually these years were extraordinarily productive. Uh, he wrote several major uh, theological works uh, on covenant theology, on church polity. That's some of the ones that are listed, and you'll see the dates uh, on the back of the sheet. But also during this time, he wrote his very famous treatise uh, on civil government and on the limitations of monarchy. That's the book uh, Lex Rex, The Law and the Prince, or The Law uh, and the King. I'll come back to that. But he played a very prominent role in the debates of the Westminster Assembly. And uh, it's generally known that uh, he, along with his uh, fairly small number of, of Scottish uh, delegates there, they had a very high influence, a disproportionate influence, really. And part of the reason for that was that they were the only ones who had experience already of a working Presbyterian church. And that was unknown still uh, in England, to the most part. So he had a big part in that. I'll come back to some of those things. In 1647, he returned uh, to St. Andrews by 51. 1651, he was the rector of the university. And such was his reputation through his writings uh, and so on that uh, he received all sorts of invitations to very prestigious universities uh, in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands. Um, but he was determined uh, just to stay in Scotland. His great desire was the church in Scotland. But that meant that he was never far from controversy. Uh, he was an unyielding protester, with a capital P, against what he saw as very naive resolutions of Parliament in 1650. And those were resolutions to, to rehabilitate former royalists who had sided with King Charles I against the Covenanters. And there was a move to try and rehabilitate them and get them back into uh, public life in Scotland because now Charles II, his son, had, had subscribed to the Covenants when he became king in 1650, and he promised, even though it was under duress, he had promised to protect Presbyterianism. So they wanted to bring these folk back into public life, and there was a, 
continuing controversy between what was called the resolutioners, those who wanted to admit these former royalists back and forgive and forget. The main reason, of course, was they wanted to get them back into the Scots army because the Scots army, meantime, had, uh, had lost a lot of uh, fighting men because they'd uh, been thrown out. But um, on the other side, there was Rutherford and the protesters or the remonstrants. So you had the resolutioners and the remonstrants. <laughs> And they saw this as just naive and uh, as folly. And I suppose it boiled down to this. The resolutioners felt that patriotism came first, and that meant they had to have national unity. And that was particularly so after Cromwell's army had, um, had routed the Scots army at, at Dunbar in 1650 because the Scots army had been weakened. They'd lost a lot of these uh, former royalists. And what they feared was these resolutioners who wanted them back, and they feared, the, they feared Cromwell and his English sectaries as the greatest threat to the Scottish church and the Scottish nation. So what they were really saying was the nation must come first, and the church has then got to make that its priority. But Rutherford and the protesters, they felt that the greatest priority was always the true faith. And they thought that the greatest threat to the faith, to the church in Scotland, wasn't from Cromwell and his independence, but was from the combination of the royalists, most of whom were uh, pro-Catholic or certainly Anglo-Catholic, and uh, other enemies of, uh, of the true gospel. So Rutherford and his side were, were generally better disposed towards the English at, at that time, even though they greatly disagreed with Cromwell about church government and, and so on. He was very against Presbyterianism. And I think there's an interesting point there and there's perhaps an interesting lesson as to which comes first, nationalism or the church. Or maybe not, maybe nationalism is the wrong word because that's got a particular political uh, tone, isn't it? But the, the needs of the, the state and the nation or protecting the gospel. And Christians often find themselves a little bit on, on different sides there. In this case, uh, it was Rutherford and his others whose skepticism was justified because... Once the monarchy was fully restored, 10 years later in 1660, immediately the parliament passed what they called the Act Recissory, and that was reversing again all the, the legislation from the Covenanters period. And it all started again, moves to re-establish episcopacy and so on, to get control of the church and control of the church's message. So politicians' promises don't last for very long. And maybe king's vows and promises don't last for very long either, sometimes. And we're perhaps wise not to put too much trust there. And following that, there were many years of persecution. And during that time, hundreds, hundreds of ministers were deposed, churches were closed. The death penalty was imposed upon uh, the field preachers because people thrown out of the churches, they had open air gatherings in what were called conventicles, where the covenanters uh, gathered to hear faithful preaching. And... Uh, they took their lives in their hand. It was a capital offense. And that's the time that's known in our history as the killing times because many, many uh, covenanters, many thousands who refused the government's lockdown on their true Christian worship, uh, they were butchered at the hands of royalists. And particularly under troops commanded by men like John Graham of Claverhouse, Viscount Dundee, now, you may not know the name John Graham of Claverhouse, but you probably know the name Bonnie Dundee because his name's been uh, romanticized and sung about in ballads, Bonnie Dundee. But uh, he wasn't called Bonnie Dundee by the Covenanters. He was known as Bloody Clavers because that's what he was. He was a butcher. I remember uh, years ago when I was in London, we had a church Cayley, and uh, at one point in the Cayley, they struck up the song of Bonnie Dundee and uh, thought this would be great, and I would be delighted because I was a Scotsman. Couldn't quite understand why I was scowling and not dancing. So I told them afterwards that I wasn't going to be dancing to any song about bloody cleavers. They may have thought I was swearing at them, but uh, anyway, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> in March 1661, in the same month that that act recissory was passed, Rutherford's book Lex Rex was burned by the public hangman in Edinburgh, the toll booth and outside his uh, college in St. Andrews. And Rutherford was summoned to face the charge of treason. But he was already dying by this time, and uh, he replied that he had already got a summons before a superior judge in judicatory, 
And he sent to them the famous message, I behove to answer my first summons, and ere your day come, I will be where few kings and great folks come. And uh, on the 30th of March, 1661, he answered that first summons. And so he was spared what would have been uh, inevitable martyrdom. Now, Rutherford ranks among uh, Scotland's greatest thinkers. He does have an abiding legacy. It shaped not just the theology and the uh, ecclesiastical government and reformed churches worldwide, not just here, but he's been notably influential as well in the development of major Western uh, political democracies. We own a great deal to his uh, writing. He's a strange man. In many ways, he was uh, a man of extremes. Um, his devotional writings are full of extraordinary emotion, expansiveness, warmth. Um, and yet some of his theological writings are very polemic, unyielding, um, and even severe. But you have to read these in the context of these tumultuous times when he lived, where fierce battles to the death were being waged uh, for the survival of the faith, for the survival of the gospel. Um, it was a time not for compromise. It was a time for contending. And you couldn't get out of that if you were being faithful. And so he was polemic. He was willing to fight. But his polemic was always in the service of the pastoral. He cared about truth and error because he cared about people. He cared about their salvation. He cared about the true church. The true church. He cared about its survival. Now his insistence on Presbyterian church government meant that he had contempt for those who just wanted to tolerate uh, independency. And that meant that they uh, earned the ire of people like Cromwell. Cromwell was a fierce independent, hated Presbyterians. Milton, the poet, uh, said that uh, the new presbyter was the old priest writ large. And he saw people like Rutherford as part of the, uh, the long parliament, the new enforcers of conscience under the long parliament, uh, he called Rutherford and others. And it's true, there was, there was an intolerance about him. And yet, at the same time, it was Rutherford who championed uh, the principles, indispensable principles of liberty that came to undergird what we now take completely for granted in our modern uh, liberal democracy. And his book, Lex Rex, it followed uh, in the path of previous reformed writings, but it was by far the most mature, the most far-reaching, the most influential exposition of uh, reformed uh, political thought. And he wrote against the idea of the divine right of kings, against the idea of limitless royal uh, sovereignty. And against that, he asserted the supremacy of the rule of law. And he declared, quote, an absolute and unlimited monarchy is not only not the best form of government, but it is the worst. Because omnipotency in one who can sin is an accursed power. An absolute monarch is a sleeping lion, and a tyrant is a waking and a devouring lion, and they differ in accidents only. And against the argument that people sometimes had, well, even tyranny is better than anarchy, he said that should be taken cum grano salus, with a grain of salt. So power, and he argued this from the scriptures extensively, power is conferred only by popular consent. And he says, quote, there is no title on earth now to tie crowns to families, to persons, but only the suffrages of the people. So it's quite easy to see, isn't it, why this was not a very popular book with kings, uh, monarchists, uh, and so on. In fact, what he was advocating was not republicanism, don't misunderstand, nor was he advocating um, full democracy, universal suffrage uh, in the modern sense, but... He was advocating what he calls, quote, a limited and mixed monarchy of delegated power with the benefits of a monarch's glory, order, and unity, the aristocracy's counsel, stability, and strength, and from the influence of the commons, liberty, privileges, and promptitude of obedience. So he saw value in all these different layers, if you like, of representation and in government. But here, here's the real rapier thrust for his times. Because a lawful king, he says, is made only by God and by the action of the people as his instrument, 
So the people have not only a right, but a duty to resist a tyrant and have the power acting as God's instrument to dethrone an evil regime. I quote, God only, by the action of the people as his instrument and by no other action makes a lawful king. God only, by the action of the people as his instrument, can dethrone a king. Um, Donald MacLeod, in his uh, excellent book, um, Therefore the Truth I Speak, Scottish Theology 1500 to 1700, he points out that he is simply following in the same line as John Knox and all his successors uh, spoke. It's not a license for anarchy. What all of these appealed to was what they called um, the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. What that means is that those in lower ranks uh, of civil authority, not the king, maybe the uh, privy council and, and parliament and so on, but they have a duty to rise up and oppose uh, tyranny and evil. So the lesser magistrates are part of God's common grace for society and for rule. And if the higher magistrates, the higher rulers, uh, are becoming tyrannous, it's up to the lesser ones to rise up and do their part and get rid of them. But if even they, all of them, the lesser magistrates, if even they are corrupt, if they're in hock with the tyranny, so what people face is total, well, totalitarian rule, then in extremis, Rutherford said, quote, we teach that any private man may kill a tyrant, void of all title. And in his discussion of this, uh, Donald MacLeod uh, likens uh, the assassination in that time of James Sharp, who was the, the bloodthirsty Archbishop of St. Andrews. He was the driving force behind Charles II's brutal repression and their slaughter uh, of the Covenanters. He likens that to um, the Czech patriots' uh, assassination of Hitler's uh, chief henchman, uh, Heydrich, in, 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 uh, in Prague in 1942. He was the man in charge of the, the final solution. Uh, or indeed the attempt to assassinate Hitler himself that uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others were involved with. Now, we need to be careful. Rutherford uh, was not a casual revolutionary. And himself, he was actually very hesitant um, to declare the grounds for the removal uh, of a king. He himself hesitated to consider Charles I uh, as an unlawful king, despite uh, all his repressions, because... He hadn't, had, he hadn't been at war with his own people. He hadn't enlisted foreign mercenaries uh, uh, against uh, his own people, foreign armies, as Mary, Queen of Scots, for example, had done against her own people. Um, Rutherford said, yes, Charles I's acts have been tyrannous at times. You can resist his injustice. But he held back from uh, believing that they should depose the king. But the logic of his arguments in Lex Rex uh, eventually became unanswerable, really. And um, in the end, as you know, Charles I was removed from power. And, uh, well, his head was removed from his body too, wasn't it? And later on, uh, James II, after the Restoration, was also deposed in the Glorious Revolution of, of 1688. And that's when the people, through their representatives, invited uh, the Protestant William of Orange uh, to come and to be the king. Now, all of these things might seem very distant history to us, and, and they are, of course. It's from another era. But that history shouldn't be forgotten. Let me quote to you Donald MacLeod again. We should not ignore the fact that it was out of the struggle for religious freedom that a wider freedom eventually emerged. From the Restoration onwards, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish judiciary, the Scottish nobility, and the Scottish episcopate were all subservient to the monarchy. Only from those determined to defend the crown rights of Jesus against the crown rights of the Stuarts, only from them did resistance come. All of society was subservient to the ruling elites. And only from a church which was clear on who the true king and lord in the land really is uh, did resistance to tyranny come. And it came with great cost attached to it. Now, it was those same principles that uh, Rutherford uh, wrote on here. Uh, these were taken up by others, by John Locke, later on in the 17th century, by Rousseau, um, by Thomas Jefferson uh, in the next century. And these things came to have a huge influence, actually, in the American Revolution. Donald MacLeod discusses in his book how direct or indirect that was. Um, but certainly, uh, there was a huge influence 
directly or indirectly. One uh, commentator remarks of this book, this turgid legal prose, there is as much emotion in the multiplication table as there is in Lex Rex. And I'm telling you, I've read it, and that is absolutely the case. Um, but its uh, seminal nature and its influence is beyond dispute. And in the middle of all these dense arguments, and it's dense, it's dense, but you come across these sorts of resounding statements. Every man by nature is a free man born. And so it's easy, isn't it, to, to see why it's been described as containing the core of the American Declaration of Independence. Let's move on to doctrine. Doctrinally, uh, Rutherford was um, a mature covenant theologian. He had a very developed theology. It grew out of uh, Genevan orthodoxy, the influence of Calvin and so on, but also from other influences in uh, the Heidelberg School and the Palatinate, very influenced by uh, Zacharias Ursinus, by Caspar Olivianus, uh, and the school of uh, so-called federal theology. Um, his Emphasis, really, was the broad emphasis of the Reformation, salvation by God's free grace. He stressed that the whole Bible reveals one great story, and it's a story organized around God's covenants with man. It talks about the pre-fall state of man and a covenant of, of nature or of works which operated, where God promised man life on the condition of obedience and threatened him with death on disobedience. Adam was the representative, the federal head. That's where the whole word federal uh, theology comes from. And it was his rebellion that uh, imputed sin and death to all mankind. But as in Adam all die, so by means of God's eternal covenant of grace, those in Christ uh, shall be made alive, as Paul puts it. And the Old Testament and the New Testament, they just represent two different administrations, if you like, of that same uh, eternal covenant of grace. The relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not one of law and grace, but it's grace in promise and grace uh, in fulfillment. And the whole Bible storyline weaves that story from eternity through time uh, and back uh, into eternity. And what that means is that the way we're saved for all mankind, wherever you come in the history of the world, it's the same. It's by God's grace. It's through faith. Whether it's prospectively looking forward to the culmination of that in the coming of Jesus, like Abraham and the Old Testament saints of Hebrew 11, or whether like us and the apostles, it's retrospectively looking back, standing on this side uh, of the great fulfillment. And that's really what Reformed theology is at its heart, uh, the story of God's covenant grace. Now, among these federal theologians, there's all kinds of differences in points of detail. Uh, Rutherford, for example, was one of those who um, expressed God's plan of salvation as a three covenant system. So um, he separate, separated out within that covenant of, of, of grace, a covenant of redemption, which he uh, spoke about as something existing in eternity between God the Father and God the Son, where Christ promised to stand as a substitute for his people and uh, bring them forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, through his atonement. So for Rutherford, that was the covenant of redemption. For him, strictly the covenant of grace um, was specifically that between God um, and the believer in history, offered freely by God's grace that responded to uh, by faith. Some of the other theologians, famous ones like Thomas Boston, um, they said, no, no, it's really just two covenants. And they would say the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, just two different ways of looking at the same thing. Some are looking at it from the perspective of God and the, uh, the Father and the Son in eternity, some from uh, from human uh, standpoint in history. But uh, whether there's really a difference there, you can argue about. Maybe it's just two different ways of expressing the same thing. Rutherford was also what was called a supralapsarian. Now, what that means is that he uh, believed that God, first of all, decreed those he would save, then logically decreed the fall, and then the means of salvation through Christ's work. Probably the majority of the Reformed theologians of the day had what's called an infralapsarian view after the fall. In other words, only having decreed or permitted the fall did God then decree to save his elect. Now, we're not going to get into the weeds of all of that, but just I make the point, just to, just to make this point, because in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which Samuel Rutherford had a, a very big part uh, in drawing up, um, it's interesting to note that 
when it talks about election, predestination, uh, it's framed very precisely, very cautiously in terms of a two-covenant scheme, not three-covenant, and in terms of um, an infralapsarian scheme, not supralapsarian, although there's a certain latitude of interpretation uh, in it. So I'm making that point because I think what it shows us is that Samuel Rutherford was a fighter, but he didn't want to fight over theological minutiae with those who are clearly on the same side of the gospel. And that's an important thing. There are some fights, and we should be able to fight for the truth of the gospel, but we shouldn't fight with those who are on the same side as us about the truth of the gospel. We can debate, we can argue friendly, we can have differences of opinion, we can have different views, but we don't want to make enemies of those who are on the same side as the gospel. I think Samuel Rutherford um, was a good example of that, and generally, if not always, uh, achieved that. He would fight vigorously where the heart of the gospel was at stake. So that's why he had these big battles about Arminianism, because in his day, that was a very great threat uh, to the whole of the Reformation. It was undermining key differences between the true evangelical faith and doctrines just becoming obscured, really, back to a Romish way of looking at things. So he fought that. He also fought uh, those who were called neonomians, including... Luminous names like Richard Baxter, who was one of those, because there was a real danger that in their theology, um, they were making faith perilously close. They would deny it, but everybody else saw it perilously close to an actual act of merit um, instead of just the instrument uh, of receiving God's free grace. So he, he battled against that to preserve the free grace of the gospel. But then he also battled against those who were the opposite of the neonomians, so-called antinomians, the anti-law people. They were so keen to safeguard God's free grace that they, they utterly played down uh, God's command to obedience and wanted to say, no, no the gospel is entirely unconditional. And then I said, Rutherford, the condition of the covenant is faith. So in all of this, what Rutherford was doing was holding together clear biblical truths which should never be separated. Here's a great statement on this. Christ's, this is from one of his uh, sermons. Christ's command to us are commanding promises and promissory commands. He charges us to do and he promises to work in us what he commands us to do. Now that is really good. That is holding together exactly the biblical uh, weight of these things. Christ's com commands to us are commanding promises and promissory commands. Anyway, whatever the intricacies of his theological exactitude, there was no mistaking uh, in all Rutherford's theological writing his great emphasis on covenant grace. And uh, the epithet by which he was known often was the prince of the covenant. So that tells you where people really understood uh, his big thing was. But I think for ordinary Christians, probably um, Rutherford's greatest uh, contribution was to the devotional life uh, of the church. And that's probably been... Well, definitely, I think, been um, uh, significant beyond all of his theological writings. Very likely, he had the principal hand in drawing up the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And, of course, that was a staple part of, uh, of Christian education for centuries. And countless families from all walks of life have, have taught their children the doctrines of the faith around the questions and answers of the Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, and so it goes. And also, the most popular uh, part of Rutherford's own writings, by far, are uh, his letters, still in print today and have been uh, ever since a few years after his birth. They were first published, uh, I think, four years, three or four years after his uh, death, and anonymously, uh, it was called Joshua Ridavivus, uh, Joshua Brought to Life Again, and uh, it was published during those killing times of the Covenanters to encourage uh, gospel people and persecuted covenanters. Um, Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century preacher, called it the nearest thing to inspiration which can be found in all the writings of mere men. So that's quite high praise, isn't it? And uh, they became a, a Christian classic. Uh, they've been reprinted endlessly uh, to today. When you read them today, you know, it, it, <laughs> they can feel a bit sort of um, overcharged with emotion. Some of the... Uh, He's always quoting from the Song of Songs, and uh, it can almost seem a little bit embarrassing. He writes this letter to a, um, 
a bereaved lady, Lady Kenmuir, and uh, urges her in her uh, loneliness at night to imagine Christ lying between her breasts. And uh, probably most of us wouldn't really write quite like that today, but um, it, was, it was because of his uh, supreme focus on the person of Christ and, um, and the, uh, the joy of Christ that made him write like that. There's some, there's some real pastoral tenderness that's uh, observable in these letters and in his other writings. So from a, from a man who was um, rapier sharp and uh, in the battle very fiercely at times, um, there's some wonderful things in the letters um, to administer the real balm of the gospel to fellow pilgrims who were suffering. He knew what it was and he was suffering with them. Here's a quote. I desire not to go on the lee side or the sunny side of religion, or to put truth betwixt me and a storm. My Savior did not do so for me, who in his suffering took the windy side of the hill. That's another thing he wrote to that same lady, uh, Lady Kenmuir. He said, be content to wade through the waters between you and glory with him, holding his hand fast, for he keepeth all the fords. And his letters, I think, have helped many, many struggling believers over the years to put their hand in the hand of the one who keeps all the fords. Maybe the greatest thing about, about Samuel Rutherford uh, is that despite these dark days, difficult days in which he lived, the many controversies he had to confront, and that involved rifts uh, with brothers in ministry over matters of ecclesiastical politics, the, the resolutioner, protester issue, and so on. But to the end of his life, he had his greatest love in preaching the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might say that even when being a polemicist, uh, was necessary for his left hand. Uh, being a pastor preacher was always still the work of his right hand. And I think that's the right balance. Um, on top of that, he laid a great insistence on preaching not just abstract doctrines about Christ, but preaching Christ, preaching the person of Christ. Um, Andrew Bonner said, um, it's not as if mere assent to a proposition can save a soul. Now, in his preaching, Rutherford held forth the crucified, risen, glorified Savior, the present Savior, in all his attractiveness, in all his grace. He held out Christ clothed with his gospel, as they used to say, calling the sinner into fellowship personally with him. And he knew that people were not saved by having perfect systematic theology. He knew that people were saved by the perfect Savior's touch. And that's important to note in somebody who strove for precision and exactitude in matters of theology. It's not your knowledge that saves you. It's Christ's knowledge of you and his touch upon you. So for all of his concern for correct theology, he was never narrow. He was never sanctimonious. He was never superior in his preaching. But he was very tenderly realistic about uh, the human frame. He was very reassuring about the wonders of God's grace to all such people. It must have, been, must have been wonderful to hear him in a communion service. And this is from a communion sermon when he was inviting to the Lord's table people who were keenly aware of their own unworthiness. And his sermon included this line, many smoking flaxes and broken reeds on earth are now up before the throne, mighty cedars, high, tall, green, planted on the branks of the river of life. That's wonderful, isn't it? That his preaching proclaimed Christ. It showed forth Christ. He offered Christ because he knew that Christ was personally present in his preaching. He knew that as he opened the word of life, Christ, the living word, was speaking to people and drawing them to himself. And so it was that even in, in 1650, which was in the middle of that awful controversy between the resolutioners and the protesters and so on, a very difficult time for him. There was an English uh, merchant visiting St. Andrews, and he summed up Samuel Rutherford's preaching this way. He said, he showed me the loveliness of Christ. He showed me the loveliness of Christ in the midst of fighting ecclesiastical battles, political intrigue, all sorts of things. That was his center. And even on his deathbed, his words to fellow ministers focused their minds and their hearts on the person of the Lord Jesus. Quote, none is comparable to him in heaven or earth. Dear brethren, do all for him. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. 
Beware of men pleasing. The chief shepherd will shortly appear. And his last words uh, on this earth were, glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. So he was first and foremost a citizen of uh, Emmanuel's land. And uh, it was that deep love for his savior, his longing for his appearing in that glory, that was really what explained uh, the man. His vision of Christ and his kingdom was, was, was huge. And that meant that he could only see his earthly life, his own service, in fact, all of the affairs of the church and indeed the nation as being irresistibly caught up in that far greater thing, the great redemptive purpose of God accomplished in the cross of Christ and cons consummation still uh, coming. So Samuel Rutherford could not have a simple gospel, an emasculated gospel. He could not have a view of the gospel as just mere pietism just about me and my savior and my salvation. Everything in the whole of time and history was overshadowed by the vastness of the centrality of the atoning work of Christ and its eternal significance. So he had what we would have to call a truly biblical eschatology, a worldview of history, seeing it all heading towards, marching towards the great glory of Emmanuel's land. All history was given Meaning was given explanation only through the gospel of Christ. And it was the wonderful certainty of that approaching day of Christ and that appearing. That was what gave him courage. That was what gave him perspective on everything that God uh, called him to do. So for him, there could never be any separation of the sacred and the secular. He could never separate doctrine and piety from ethics, from social responsibility. All of these were just part of one great whole over which no other but Christ uh, was the king, and all of which was marching inexorably towards its fulfillment in the glory that's dawning from Emmanuel's land. So the way he expresses things sometimes, no doubt it's strange to us today, the world he inhabited was very different, smaller horizons and so on. Concepts of, of nations being covenanted under God, it seems a, a foreign thing in our pluralist world today. But I think we have to say that there was an integration, there was a wholeness about uh, Rutherford's view of the world and of eternity that is often sadly lacking in a lot of uh, contemporary Christian thinking today of where so often spiritual experiences are privatized things. It's just about me. It's, it's the Christian compartment of my life alongside all sorts of other things. Maybe the Christian compartment that has some Christian music and some Christian thinking and some Christian friends and some Christian holidays and this and that in it, but quite divorced from, uh, from our secular uh, world and lives outside. And I think that we need in the church a, a recovery of that kind of perspective so that we don't shrink the glorious gospel of Christ into a man-centered thing, into a, just a psychological or even a spiritual solution for my personal need. And that often is what it has become uh, in our more recent times. It's when people have that breadth of vision. It's when they grasp the sheer magnitude of God's eternal covenant purposes. It's when people have such confidence in the transforming power of the gospel of grace. It's when people have that deep love for the person of Christ the Savior himself. Well, it's then, isn't it, that people are going to say, those people show me the loveliness of Christ and the greatness uh, of the gospel. So in the uh, sketch that Andrew Boner gives uh, in the beginning of, uh, in the preface to his letters, he ends it with these words, oh, for 10 such men in Scotland to stand in the gap. And I think that's what we should be praying for or many more than 10, men like Samuel Rutherford who have that great vision and who will come to the aid of the church and the nation, have a little look at the news and see if we don't need men of stature like that uh, in our land today and in the church uh, today. Well, there's a, a bit of a sketch, a bit of a broad brush strokes, but let's break and we're going to sing uh, the hymn that was written by Annie Ross Cousins, has about 
25 verses, but we're only going to sing five. And uh, all the lines are taken from lines from Samuel Rutherford's letters written uh, in Aberdeen. And uh, we're going to sing it to the old tune, which is called uh, Rutherford. The sands of time are sinking, the dawn of heaven breaks. <laughs> 